Well, hello and welcome to our Bible study with Phil. Now, let's just address the elephant in the room. It's not an elephant, it's a reindeer. Yes, Phil is wearing one of his notoriously ugly Christmas jumpers. So clearly, it's got to be Christmas. And I'm by my Christmas tree, which is twinkling away, as you can see. So what does this mean for our Bible study? Well, it means we're going to be shelving uh, Peter's uh, Bible study for uh, just for this month. And we're going to be taking a look at the Christmas story. So we're going to be doing this looking at Luke's Gospel. So for the next four weeks, today we're going to be looking at the foretelling of John. The following week, we're going to be looking at the foretelling of Jesus's birth. And then we're going to look at the birth of John and all that surrounds that. And then on Christmas Eve, we're going to take a look at the birth of Jesus. So this is something quite special. As always, I'm going to be uh, reading from the New Living Translation. We're in Luke's Gospel, reading from verse 5 to verse 25. Uh, and this uh, is going to be an opportunity for us just to be able to celebrate, essentially, why Christmas. Uh, an opportunity for us to be able to celebrate uh, the wonder of what Christmas means to us. And let's face it, uh, we could all do with a reason to celebrate, especially at this time period, what with COVID and the way that it's affecting Christmas and all of that. I think we, if there was ever a moment where hope needed to be on display, now is that moment. So I don't know about you, Christmas, as, as fun as it is, is also incredibly hectic. For those of us without actually that much money, the, the nervousness of entering into Christmas knowing that probably actually we're going to come out the other end of it uh, worse off financially, uh, that does play all manners to it. But you then throw into all the extras that go with that, with the, the restrictions because of COVID, with the fear of it uh, destroying our Christmas uh, because we fall ill, our loved ones fall ill, because the restrictions make it difficult for us to be able to see the ones that we love. All of that, that's a lot of external pressure that has got unbelievable effects on the internal. So before we jump into the study, let's take a moment. Let's press pause. Let's slow down our breathing. Invite Jesus to meet us right here, right now in this moment. And that through this moment, we might have an encounter with God. And that his peace might become real in our lives. So. Let us do this now. And at the end of that silence, I'm going to pray and then we'll jump into our scripture. So let's just invite Jesus now to meet us here. Heavenly Father, as we celebrate Christmas, Lord, we are so grateful for that incredible gift that you gave yourself. And as you did, as you laid down your life for us, though we do not deserve it, you gave us a gift which we do not deserve, the wonderful ability to join you in the afterlife. Lord, to be able to spend eternity with you in paradise. Lord, now the world we live in feels absolutely divorced from the concept of paradise. And Lord, we just want to invite you just to meet us here in this moment to bring your peace, your joy, and your hope into our lives. Lord, we invite you by the power of your spirit to speak to us through the scriptures that we look at. God, that we may be lifted out of our distress and into your hope. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. So, shall we, uh, shall we take a moment and, uh, and read this together? So, because this is quite a long chunk of scripture, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read a section and then dissect it, then read the next section and dissect it and go through it that way. So, uh, so join me as we read through this together. When Herod was king of Judea, there was a Jewish priest named Zechariah. He was a member of the priestly order of Abijah, 
and his wife, Elizabeth, was also of the priestly line of Aaron. Zechariah and Elizabeth were righteous in God's eyes, careful to obey all the Lord's commandments and regulations. They had no children because Elizabeth was unable to conceive and they both were very old. Okay, let's just press pause there and just take a quick look at this. So the first part is King Herod, uh, uh, historically known as Herod the Great. I'm not sure if he did anything particularly that was great, uh, but we know that he is sitting on the throne. So this gives us a time period. Uh, so uh, and then we're then introduced to Zachariah uh, and uh, we know that he's a priest and we know from what family he comes from and this matters to the Jewish people lineage is everything and so we've got uh, from what order he is and interestingly his wife also uh, is a Levi uh, and so she uh, is from the priestly line of Aaron so we're then told that they lived righteous in God's eyes why does this matter well this is clear we need to know that uh, the reason that elizabeth has got no children is not because of any sin on her behalf this is not a punishment this is actually she's just barren and in a culture where particularly you know the, the time period that we're talking about that if a woman has no children then it's almost like her purpose in life uh, which is to normally to, to raise the family and to look after the family that she's actually not able to do that and there's an element of shame that goes with that especially from her and she would have really have felt this is that actually the one task that she had she wasn't able to fulfill properly uh, and so people would question you know well it must be she's obviously done something wrong that's why when actually as we know here this is not the case she's barren just because she can't have children uh, and and we know what that is like and that feeling of not being able to have children you know just is going to be something that's going to be deeply rooted in them as a couple we're going to look at that in a brief moment so verse 8 one day Zechariah was serving God in the temple for his order was on duty that week as the custom as was the custom of the priests they he was chosen by lot to enter the sanctuary of the Lord and burn incense. While the incense was being burned, a great crowd stood outside praying. Okay, so let's take these three verses. So, first of all, we know that his role is that he's actually a priest who serves in the temple his order so the group that he was part of was on now uh, i had to look this up i find all this really interesting so the first thing that's worth noting is that actually uh, the, the all of these orders and they would be uh, their roles would be dotted throughout the year and they would serve two weeks divided at different points during the year and that would be their role to go in and to do something within the temple and there's lots of jobs to do in the temple so they would all be busy and they would serve for that full week so what's interesting here is that uh, that's that's his role he's he's in there and he's doing it and they would be chosen by lot now that's not that there was some guy called lot who literally chose them it was that they cast lots which essentially is like dice and and depending on who uh, got the winning one would be holding the most prestigious of all the jobs which was what we see Zachariah here and his role is to go into the Holy of Holies to go into the inner sanctuary of the church the temple where only one person was ever allowed to go and his job is to burn incense whilst he's in there and whilst he's in there because this is a holy moment for Israel there's a great crowd of people all outside also praying so his job as he goes in and again i had to read about this but his job whilst he's in there is to pray and intercede on behalf of the nation of israel so he's in there to pray for them now one of the things that's worth noting here and this is why this story matters so much is it has been 400 years over 400 years since god last spoke to the people of israel 
to the people of Israel at this point, they are desperately waiting for God to speak. A God who seemed to have spoken over and over again throughout the Old Testament, prophet upon prophet, many written down, loads not written, you know, and then suddenly God goes silent and we don't see any prophets. This means something because the all of these prophecies point forward to a messiah so they're waiting on a messiah but yeah he's silent so many of the jewish people begin to read into this and like you know what's the messiah going to look like where is the messiah going to be born what facts do the prophets tell us and so you know there's this element of just expectation his job here is to go in and pray on behalf. And I imagine that some of the things he'd have been praying about would have been like, God, would you answer your people? Lord, would you speak again? Lord, would you end the silence? He'd be praying also for the sins of the nation. You know, this, this is a difficult time for the nation. Not only is God silent, but the Roman Empire is now sitting on Israel. And so that they are now underneath the Roman Empire and the rule of, and there are Roman soldiers everywhere. This is not a nice time for the Jewish people. So that's what's going on. And then we get this, verse 11. While Zechariah was in the sanctuary, an angel of the Lord appeared to him standing on the right of the incense altar. We're even told exactly whereabouts. I love that. Verse 12, Zechariah was shaken and overwhelmed with fear when he saw him. And actually, you know, we're told angels are rather tall. I mean, uh, the, 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 we're, we're told that they're usually like seven foot plus tall, you know, and, and they're not going to look like you and me. And I can imagine that he would be afraid. I, I've yet to see an angel. Now that's, I say the word yet because I'm definitely up for if God chooses to give me a message, you know, from him and it, he chooses to use an angel, I am going to be so overjoyed. But I think I also, in that moment, I'm going to be overwhelmed equally with fear as in like, this is quite a scary moment. But imagine it from his perspective, 400 years, nothing, suddenly there's an angel standing before him. This has got an added element to it. And also, is this angel going to bring good news? Or is this angel going to bring bad news? Well, let's find out. Well, the angel said, verse 13, Don't be afraid, Zechariah, for God has heard your prayer. Ooh, what prayer? But he goes on and explains. Your wife, Elizabeth, will give you a son, and you are to name him John. Okay, so before we go on any further, like, God's answering the prayer and he's answering a specific prayer and it's maybe not the prayer that we expected. Although what we go on to hear, we get to hear some of that prayer that we imagined that actually was also prayed at the same time is tied into this. But I wonder how many times John has prayed for a son. I imagine that you know, in his earlier years, he would have prayed for a wife who would bring him a son, who would bring him children and a family, and he would have prayed about it. Then he gets married and he's praying about it. And every time her cycle comes to an end and she's, you know, reminded that she hasn't had a baby this month, maybe next month, I imagine he prayed about it. I imagine he's prayed about this hundreds of times. And then as her biological clock is coming to an end, the earnest prayer on behalf, Lord, please don't let this be our lot in life. And then she doesn't have a child. Does he continue to pray? Or is God answering the prayers of before? What did he pray whilst he was in there? We're not told what he prayed for. We only are told that God has answered that prayer. Love this. Verse 14, you will have great joy and gladness and many will rejoice at his birth. Why will many rejoice at his birth? Well, because this is a miracle child. Everyone knows that they're old. Something special must be happening because Elizabeth, she's well beyond the age and yet she has a baby. For he will be great in the eyes of the Lord, verse 15. He must never touch wine or alcoholic drinks. This is essentially him saying that he's been set aside for uh, for great things, like you know that he's not allowed to partake in the normal aspects of life. Why? Because there's something special about him, and because of that, he will do great things. 
Um, and then it's, it goes on and says he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before his birth. And in a, in a couple of weeks, we'll, we'll get a little bit of a sample of that even before he was born. Uh, and he will turn the Israelites to their Lord, their God. He will be a man with the spirit and power of Elijah, which is one of the Old Testament big prophets, you know, that, that that's renowned and still talked about. And it's kind of like that, you know, that actually Elijah, the, the wonder all the, of, of that was of Elijah, this man's going to carry like an anointing that matches that love that but he's also going to turn many of the hearts of the israelites back to god which tells us that clearly not everybody who is an israelite is actually walking with god i like this and he will prepare the people for the coming of the lord well we know that to be jesus but like there's an excitement here he will turn their hearts of the fathers to their children and will cause those who are rebellious to accept the wisdom of the godly. So I essentially, I imagine he's probably gone in to pray amongst other things that God would speak again. Not only is God speaking right now to Zechariah, but he's foretelling that his own son, which is a miracle baby, is going to carry an anointing and be the next prophet. So from the time of Malachi until now, there's been silence. And then now there was a birth of a new prophet who is going to usher the Lord's plan into being. That that the whole nation is, is waiting for, earnestly praying for, for the Messiah to come. And it's John's job to bring that into being. I love this. This is really cool. Zechariah verse 18 said to the lord i said to the angel how can i be sure that this will happen i am an old man now and my wife is also well along in years now as much as this is a blatant lack of faith on his behalf there's also a moment of him just being realistic and taking a step back and saying how could this be i'm old and my wife's also old like this sounds too good to be true Gabriel's response here, to be fair to Gabriel, not a bad shout, right? You know, he says, verse 19, then the angel said, I am Gabriel. I stand in the very presence of God, and it is he who has sent me to bring you this good news. But now, since you didn't believe what I said, you will be silent and unable to speak until the child is born, for my words will certainly be be fulfilled at the proper time so this is really quite something we now know that he's now not going to be able to speak uh, in fact actually later on he actually makes symbols when there's there's actually a uh, belief that not only was he not able to speak but he probably also wasn't able to hear like he's been made completely dumb uh, deaf and dumb uh, many actually uh, believe so, um, because I think it's in verse 62. Yeah, I was right. In verse 62, it says, So they used gestures to ask the baby's father what his name meant. So that, that idea that they made gestures, if he was able to hear, they would have just asked him a question and he would have written on a tablet. But they made gestures, in other words, that he couldn't. Not only could he not speak, but he also appeared not also to be able to see. Uh, to hear as well so they're having to make gestures so we can see it so now let's jump back again to to where we're at um so verse 21 right, okay so while this is going on he's obviously been in there a lot longer than normal because we've got this verse 21 meanwhile the people were waiting for zachariah to come out of the sanctuary wondering why he was taking so long when he finally did come out he couldn't speak to them then they realized from his gestures and his silence, that he must have seen a vision in the sanctuary. Verse 23. When Zechariah's week of service in the temple was over, he returned home. Can you imagine? It wasn't like the following day, but he's got to do the rest of his week. All the time processing this. And also thinking, I've got to tell my wife when I get home. Like, wow, what a thing to be able to hold on to. 
verse 24. Soon afterwards, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and she went into seclusion for five months. Now, I looked into this and, and actually nobody understands why the five months. So if you are kind of going, oh, Phil, what's the significance of five months? Do you know what? Nobody actually knows. Uh, but it was, you know, I think maybe she was a little bit nervous that she, obviously she feels like maybe she's become pregnant. She's worried in those early, early, early days maybe to lose it. I mean, who knows? Um, but it does mean that then when she kind of comes out, you know, five months later, like, wow, that like the, everybody in the town is going to be talking about Elizabeth, the elderly lady, you know, the one who we've all, you know, maybe she was great with everybody else's kids and she's that sort of woman. Who knows? But what we do know is that, that there's a sense even within the community of Or. But her reaction is this. Verse 25. I love this. How kind the Lord is. Isn't he? And he, she exclaims. He has taken away my disgrace of having no children. The first thing I just want to point out from this, this is just the obvious one, is that God's timing is absolutely perfect. And sometimes we pray for stuff and we're expecting it to happen right now. Sometimes we pray and we're asking God, you know, Lord, are you not listening to my prayers? And God, you know, we looked at this on Sunday, uh, you know, the concept of being persistent if we're going to bring something to God, we've got to keep praying for it and keep praying for it. And I just want to encourage you to do just that. Because here we see an answer to prayer that's come about in God's perfect timing. Note the perfect timing of this. You see, if she'd have had a baby whilst she was in her 20s, in her prime of life, nobody would have su suspected even the slightest that this would be a special child. Would the glory have been given to God? Maybe by a close few friends who will be rejoicing with her. Family members getting excited. Oh, there's going to be another baby in the house. Woo! But because of her old age, I guarantee everybody in the town is talking about it. Have you heard? Have you heard Elizabeth? Old Elizabeth. Baron Elizabeth. Can you imagine? And so I'm also aware when God answers prayers, he tends to answer prayers in a way that causes people to go, ooh. Sometimes God's answers to prayers come at timings that we don't expect. But we should pray. So I do again, as we're looking at prayer at the moment, we're praying desperately that God would grow our church. And we're looking at growth across all of the areas of our church. We're looking that God would grow us as disciples, that God would grow the mission of, of, of the churches and the things that we're able to see, that God would grow that. He would grow a desire within our hearts for his Holy Spirit, that we as a church would be excited and we would note that as we're going deeper into the things of God, we are growing in our relationship and that we would grow also in numbers. We long desperately for our community to come to know God for themselves, that the light and life and hope and joy of everything that is good about God would become a reality in the homes of the streets that lie around our church. So when we're praying for growth, we're praying for all of these things. And I want to encourage you at home also to pray. And if there's any other areas that you would like us to pray with you for, then I want to encourage you to do just that. Get in touch. Ask us to join because we would be privileged to do just that. So at the end of this study, I'm, I'm really excited to, to move on to uh, our next one next week as we begin to look at uh, the, you know, the, 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 the special aspect uh, that lies around Jesus's birth as we meet Mary. Um, you know, this is this is great and we're really excited about that. But before we start worrying about what's going to happen next week, let's take a moment just to allow maybe God just to speak to us through the words that we've heard today. Again, let's take a moment silence and then I'll close in prayer.
Heavenly Father, I thank you for what we've heard right now. And Lord, we are excited to know, Lord, that you are the God who hears and answers prayers. And Lord, we just want to again just invite you into the lives of everybody that's watching. And Lord, you know their hearts and you have heard their cries. And Lord, we ask you, would you answer their prayers lord for us as a church as we look to grow deeper in the things of you lord we ask that you would also add to our numbers as people are hearing the good news lord that they would believe and be baptized lord we just thank you for all that we've heard and lord we just ask give us opportunities to be able to share the good news this christmas that you have come and that you are in the business of saving lives. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, from me, thank you very much for joining us. And I look forward to seeing you at our next study. But until then, have a blessed week.